Hey guys, I want to welcome you back for our FBC Okeechobee podcast. We hope that you've been enjoying our time going through um, the book of Mark. I know, Marie, have you been enjoying doing this? Sure. Sure. <laughs> don't, don't be so excited about it. So, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry about that, guys. Her lack of excitement. I don't even know what to say. But um, we're going to continue in Mark chapter 2 today. Specifically picking up in verse um, verses 21 and 22. And this is just a continuation of the conversation from last time when you looked at the flow. We didn't get very far last time. Well, no, sorry. we didn't. Which I'll is, try to stay on track. Psh, we can chase whatever rabbit we want to chase. Who cares? So um, with that, he continues down into this next section when they were asking him about the fasting and stuff. And there is a lot of... I think deep symbolism in this particular little section comparing Judaism and the Old Testament law with Christianity and the new covenant under Christ and how those two things work and fit together. So verses 21 and 22, and we may only make it through two verses today. And if we only make it through two verses, who cares? All right, verse 21. Besides, Jesus is continuing, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leave an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. And so what Jesus is doing right here is he's using this illustration of these two things to show how you can't, put something new in something old and for it to work. And the interesting thing is like with the the wineskin thing is especially interesting because what would happen was they would make these wineskins out of goat hide. Mm -hmm. And when they would first make them, they would be kind of pliable and stretchy, but over time, naturally, that leather would become more brittle. And so they would pour the, the, um, the juice into the wine skin and allow it to ferment. And when it ferments, it produces it gas and it right. expands. And so you couldn't do that twice because that brittle wine skin, when the pressure of the fermentation took place, pop. Well, because it stretches and yes. it's already reached its maximum. It's reached its maximum. Viability. So you fill it up and it right. tries to stretch again. It will so, crack. It's not, it's not going to work. Yeah, first. it's going to crack because it's old leather and it's already been stretched one time. So it's fairly rigid. Yes. Yeah, it's got a little more rigidity to it. Rigidity, I like that word. A little more rigidity to it, and it can't work. So Jesus uses these illustrations, and what is he talking about? I mean, that's the big question here. Like, why did he all of a sudden bust into talking about patching pants and wineskins? Well, I think what he's going back to is he understands something at this point in Mark chapter 2 that nobody else understands that Christianity is coming, the new covenant is coming, and that so much of the old covenant is about to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And that Christianity won't fit inside Judaism. It's a new thing. And it's not going to fit anymore. Um, You know, you think about the Old Testament, you know, what do you you think about? You think about the law, right? Mm -hmm. You know, thou shalt not. You also think about all of the, the ritual. The ritual that had been stacked on top of what the law actually said with, by the Pharisees. Plus, you had the actual um, rituals and the ceremonies and all those things that actually did take place, the clean and unclean, all those kind of things. Christianity doesn't fit in that. It doesn't work. Because... Christianity fulfills the law. Christ's sacrifice fulfilled the law. It's not really contained within it. Like there's no need for us as Christians to sacrifice anymore. Right. It's already been a sacrifice. It's over. The final one happened. There's no need for us to eat clean and unclean. There's no need for us to wash our hands in a certain way. Although, wash your hands. <laughs> yes. Coronavirus, wash your hands. So, but they wash their hands in a very specific and certain way. You know, they, they had all of the rules and regulations for the Sabbath, all these things. Christianity didn't work in that. Christianity took all of that and wiped it away. Now, as I've talked about on many occasions, preaching, 
I think I've talked about it on a podcast, multiple different platforms. It did not wipe away the moral code of the Old Testament. Yeah, I think that's really difficult for people to understand and deal with both. Yes. And yeah, you wrap know, their minds around. We're going to understand three parts. Three parts to the law in the Old Testament. There was the civil law, like legitimately, their governmental law for civil disobedience and criminal code and all of that stuff is contained within the Old Testament, like how to sue someone, criminal penalties, all of it's contained within the Old Testament. Then you had the ceremonial. That's the different kinds of sacrifices for different things. That's the clean and unclean. That's the ceremonial washing. That's all of that stuff. Keeping the Sabbath, all of the different um, festivals and feasts and holidays, the holy days, Passover, all those things. Those are all in the Old Testament. And then there was the moral code. And the moral code is universally pretty much brought over from the Old Testament and restated in the New Testament. Pop quiz, which is the only one of the Ten Commandments not restated word for word in the New Testament. I have no idea. Keep the Sabbath. Okay. The other nine are all restated. Keeping the Sabbath is absolutely is actually not restated, but we still honor that, and we still follow a type of Sabbath in dedicating time to worship God. But we transition from right from Saturday to Sunday because for the Jews the Sabbath was Saturday. We transition to Sunday because that was the Lord's Day, that was Resurrection right. Sunday, and so that's how we've kind of changed that. It also differentiated Christianity from Judaism early on. It was one way to kind of differentiate there. So that moral code is all brought over, but all that other stuff is left behind, and that's what Christ is talking about here, I think. He's like, all the rituals, ceremonies, the clean and unclean, that's not going to be a part of what I'm doing. It's hard, though, because like that wineskin that has been used and is reached its maximum and is kind of rigid, it's hard for people to let go because that's how their hearts have become. Yes. You know, and that's what they're used to. And um, their whole world was wrapped up in... Oh, for them, for them, biblically, the Pharisees, their whole world was wrapped around Mm -hmm. these things. So for them, the idea of something new that fulfilled the old? Because remember, Christ did not come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. Because of what He did, you didn't need those other things. You still needed the moral code because that still applies to us because that tells us how we should live our lives. And that's brought over and even really expanded upon. You know, like um, the, the Bible tells us not to commit adultery. Jesus says to look upon a woman lustfully is to commit adultery, Right? And so Jesus even expanded on some of the things in, in the moral side of the law and holds us to an even higher standard in some instances. Which just helps us understand where we are in relation to God. It helps yeah. us to see our sin for what it is. Yes, that we are sinners in need of a but Savior. how that sin is overcome has been transitioned into this. But the thing is, though, um, like if you go back all the way to, let's say, Abraham, they looked forward to Christ's coming. Yes. And I wonder if they saw things even a little bit more clearly than people did towards the um, time of Christ where they were so wrapped up in the law and that's what was going to save them. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I know that they were looking forward to the Messiah still, but um, I don't know. I, I feel like they have gotten so entwined with the law and so um, reliant upon it that um, it made it difficult for their hearts to, to accept what Christ came to do. Um, but still it says, doesn't it say in Hebrews or um, somewhere that um, they their faith looking towards the future of the Messiah is what gave them yeah. salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David David talks about looking forward to this king that would come. 
Abraham's looking forward to it. Isaiah's looking forward to it. Ezekiel's looking forward to it. They all they all are. And I do agree that I think for especially not even necessarily your probably your average Israelite, your average Jewish person of the day, but your religious leaders were definitely so wrapped up in their their religiosity, mm-hmm. their their own particular little thing, their their brand that they had put together and they had people doing what they said. I think they were extremely wrapped up in that. And so the idea that Christ was coming to kind of set the people free from that and and make a better way. Because the law itself, you know, the the, the Old Testament law was really served one great purpose. And that was to show the people their need for a Savior because they could never fulfill that law. They couldn't keep the moral side. They couldn't keep the ceremonial side. They couldn't keep any of it right. And so they were in need of forgiveness in another way. And so that's what Christ came to do was to set them free from those things. And so he's looking at these Pharisees and he's saying, boys, what I'm fixing to do isn't going to be contained within your way of thinking. It's not going to be contained within your religious um, um, conveniences and your rituals and your ceremonies. I'm coming to fulfill those things. Those things are not even going to be needed anymore because of what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm bringing I a whole so new. That. I'm bringing a whole new light to this. Mm-hmm. And man, when you go back and look at that and compare it to what we have under the new covenant. I'm really glad I'm under the new instead of the old. There was a way to salvation yeah. through both, but I'm really glad I'm I'm in the old or the new instead of the old. Mm-hmm. That was some uh, that was some difficult stuff. That it I like that you said it can't be contained because I think that is pretty accurate. It can't be contained within the the box that we put put it in. But I think that that goes to us today too. God is mm-hmm. continually doing new things, and we can't become so rigid that He can't stretch us a little more because when we refuse to be stretched, um, whether that's before salvation or after salvation, then He can no longer use us and He yeah. can't continue to do those new things. Yeah, and it's not that the at this point, the covenant is not changing. We have the covenant with God through Jesus Christ that will get us all the way to the end of the book. Mm-hmm. Okay, It's going to get us all the way to the end. But the way those truths are taught and expressed to the greater world around us still can change form. The substance never changes. The message never changes. But the way we convey that message does still change. And I think that's something that a lot of churches are really, really bad at. They get, much like the Pharisees, stuck in their box of how You're supposed to do things at church. And maybe those none of those things are wrong, but they're just tradition. And when we get ourselves trapped and caught in tradition as new ways of spreading the gospel as it is written properly become available to us, we don't use them. Like, look, there was a huge push against like online church and digital methods within the church, really until just recently. Coronavirus turned everybody's eyes around and changed a lot of that. Because you have people that, oh, that's not church. Well, then we were reduced to, this is all we got. Mm -hmm. And I was never in that camp. I thought, well, the the digital landscape is somewhere where we can use to spread the gospel. That's why I was a proponent of those kind of things, you know, myself. But... I think a lot of churches get caught in those tradition traps. See, it's the Pharisees. They were caught in tradition. They were caught in their way of doing things, and they couldn't see that something new was happening in front of them, and they could join in with that. So I think a lot of churches get trapped there. I think it goes beyond just that, though, because I see what you're saying, and that falls in line with church tradition and things like that. But I think it can mean our spiritual lives, because I see what you're saying, and God set in motion what is to be done, and that is to accept Christ, and and He died um, once and for all, and 
yes, that is true. But I think we can still be rigid in how we how we think of him sometimes in that um, what we consider to be um, to be sin even um, and say, well, the rest of the world is doing this, so that's okay. But what if God is tugging on someone's heart and saying, I want you to think about this thing that's in your life, this um, way of speaking or this um, type of show that you're watching. And maybe God is calling someone to stretch a little bit more and accept a little bit more of what he has for them. Um, because I think that we can become rigid in that way too, in our spiritual lives where we are content mm -hmm. where we're at. And I think that God might still be calling us to do something that's new for us. Maybe not new for him. Maybe that's part of his holiness, um, but he is depthless. And he may be stretching us in ways that is that are uncomfortable for us, but we have to be open to it if we're going to continue to understand him in his fullness. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense or not. It does that we get caught in a rut in our spiritual life. And when we're caught in that in that rut of how we're living our lives, we're not continuing to grow in, in holiness and right. not trying to be more like Him. We're just kind of satisfied with what we got and where we're at and what we're doing. Right. And the Pharisees were very satisfied where they at and what they had and what they were doing. And they didn't want to see anything different. Mm -hmm. Even though Christ was like literally jumping up and down and waving his, waving his hands in front of their face. They simply refused to listen. Yeah, and it goes, um, I've been reading this book. I keep talking to you about it. And, um, yes, I feel like, like I'm reading it. I'm reading it, <laughs> you know, vicariously, yes. Me. Yes, because I like to share. Um, it's basically just about psychology, and it is not Christian um, based or with a Christian perspective. But one Actually, I would say it's almost not a Christian perspective. You know, I, I, would, yeah. I, would, I would term the author what you said to me is I would, I would, I would consider him probably atheist. Yeah, I would think that yeah. that's accurate. Um, but so much of what is said is um, I can translate into um, like a Christian mindset or a Christian worldview. One of the things that he said that they found in psychology is that people are um, very, they like to portray themselves as being moral. But typically, they want to be perceived by others as moral more so than they want to actually um, be so when no one is watching. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of reflects our heart condition in our spiritual lives and how um, God is constantly working on each one of us to go deeper yeah. and to, like you said, just seek, seek holiness and sanctification and um, that is going to look different as we continue to walk um, through this life and through our experiences understand more about him because I understand more about him now um, than I did when I was younger just because of some of the experiences that he's given us with um, Charlie especially as a parent you know you're being stretched and it's difficult and you can either succumb or you can allow him to continue to do new things in your life. I, I totally agree with you um, that, that God does stretch us and continue to, to move us and some of us are very resistant mm -hmm. to that. I've been resistant to that in moments of my it's life. It's difficult. Yeah I mean it is. It, it's hard to um, to have God tell you something that you're doing is not what you're supposed to be doing when whatever it was you were doing, you liked doing. Yeah, and imagine, um, let's say that just our our natural selves are satisfied that other people view us as moral. It's hard to then, I don't know, move ourselves into, um, continue to stretch ourselves in the right direction when it's for for. For God alone, it's not for man. It's not for man to mm -hmm. see. It is something on the inside when, um, I don't know. And it's easy to look at the Pharisees and think how foolish they were in rejecting what Christ was telling them. But we do the same thing yeah. when he's asking to flip our worlds upside down because that is essentially what he's doing here for them. Yeah, I've looked, at, I've looked across the whole of the Old Testament. And, you know, I look at sometimes the Israelites and some of the, you know, the dumb things they did. Like, go read the book of Judges. It's like, what were you people thinking? The book of Joshua, Exodus. I mean, you know, they're, they want to rebel against Moses, like, not long after the Red Sea. And I'm going, what a bunch of dummies. And then I think back, I go, 
we're not really different. Right. When we're the our, same bunch yeah, of dummies. When our comfort is at stake or, you know, mm-hmm. our livelihoods are at stake or things get shaken up and things are different. I used to, when you're young, it's easy to think that um, change isn't a big deal because change is constantly happening. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I can see the allure of being comfortable and not wanting to continue to change. Yeah, but so there was change happening for the nation of Israel through Christ, and it was going to spread out to the world. And then that change is still supposed to be happening within us. And so sometimes that means we have to kind of change our mindset, and we have to we have to have a, a new wine skin in our mind mm-hmm. to change how we were thinking and what we were doing exactly. to bend our will to God's will. So much we want to bend God's will to our will. That never right. works. We fool ourselves into thinking we're doing that. Instead, you would bend to God. Mm-hmm. And that's what Christ was telling them to do. Guys, just follow me. Just do what I'm saying. Everything's going to be okay. And they absolutely and refuse. Be it will. It will absolutely be better. The, the new covenant is so much better than the old covenant. Absolutely. And the old could not contain the new. It was, you know, I kind of think about it. It was almost like with the new wineskin. You have the old one over here and you're going to tie a new one to it. And it's over here. It's not that they're, to- it's not that they're disconnected. It's that this is the continuation and the fulfillment of all those things. There's still value in the Old Covenant. We still learn so much from the Old Testament about God and who He is because He has not changed. His holiness is still there. His judgment that that we see in the Old Testament, His judgment still falls upon people that don't know Jesus Christ. So we, we have all of these things that are bringing us over and it's one story, but there's this second part that's like fulfilling all the things that are talked about in the first. And so we're not throwing that old wineskin out. I want to be very careful to make sure people understand that. Man, I love the Old Testament. I preach out of it all the time. Matter of fact, I'm starting a sermon series in a week or so about Psalm 119. We're not going to go through every verse because that would be wild. I actually um, was reading about it and there was one guy preached... 127 consecutive really? sermons about Psalm 119. It's like, no, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. But we're gonna take just like we're saying for like four weeks and look at some key parts. But I love that, and we don't need to leave that behind, you know, because there is a move by some to kind of disconnect the Old Testament from the New Testament, and that is not what we do. The new is a fulfillment of the old, and if I don't understand the old and study it and know it, I don't understand what it fulfilled. Mm-hmm. I'm missing half the picture. I mean, as an avid reader, I love a good storyteller, and God is the best storyteller of all. Yeah. It's like reading a good book, and you get to the end, and you're like, I never saw that coming, but then after you see the end, you can go back, and through the whole story, you see what you didn't see the mm-hmm. first time, and that is what God has done yeah. in this story. And, and one of the fun things is, when you get over to the book of Acts, there were, and the Bible's very specific about this, it tells us that a number of the Pharisees did finally come to know Christ. I don't know if it was any of these that he's, that, that, that he's having this conversation with here, but that does give me hope mm-hmm. that these guys that were so deep into this, that after the resurrection, after the church began, after Pentecost, some of them did come to know Christ. So they just needed a little yeah. more time. And God to see a little more. They mm-hmm. still finally submitted to God, mm-hmm. and they got it right. So even if somebody that you know maybe in our lives that is so hard and can eat legalistic. You know, they're maybe they're not necessarily clinging to the Old Testament and want to, you know, sacrifice, you know, goats and stuff. But they're very legalistic and set in their ways and will not, don't want any methods or anything to change. If God can work in those Pharisees, God can work in those people too. And so that our, our churches and our individual lives can be better about seeking holiness and spreading the gospel. You can't force it on anyone else, though. I think no. you're... The, the best thing that you can do is just focus on your own heart mm-hmm. and make sure that that's where it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. pray for them. And, and God, God works. And I've seen that in some folks mm-hmm. that were very um, kind of stuck. And I've seen God break them out of that. And it was, it was neat to see. It was very encouraging to go, man, God's, God's still working. 
He's still working on me. I mean, yeah. he's he's always trying to teach me, show me something new, and I'm a stubborn joker. You can attest to that. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm thinking about myself, actually. But, yes. yeah, I'm just thankful for the grace of another day mm-hmm. and that he doesn't give up on us. That was nice of you not to say anything bad about me right there. I set you up nicely. You did a good job. <laughs> All right, very good. But I've enjoyed our conversation today about the wineskins. Yeah. And we'll uh, do two more verses next time, maybe. Okay. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but guys, we're glad you joined us for the FBC Okeechobee podcast. We hope that you uh, enjoyed this and are studying along with us in the book of Mark. So uh, if you want to go ahead and read ahead, pick up next not week. And Yeah, not too far, <laughs> but I get that far. If you go ahead and read the next section down there in uh, chapter 2, verse 23, and we'll see you next Tuesday.